Thanks so much for inviting me here uh, to participate in your program. And accordingly, I want to say a few words about what else? Racial segregation and racial integration during my time in the service. Now, during World War II, prior to World War II, during World War II and after, segregation was part of the fabric of this country, particularly in the South, and the military was rigidly segregated. In World War II, it was amazing. I always thought the Army's number one task was racial segregation, and number two was winning the war. That seemed to be the way they were organized, because whenever we went, we were rigidly segregated. Now, I went into service in 1943. Uh, I turned 18 in June of 43. And, well, actually, I took the exam in March of 43. The special thing that the Army and the Navy had, if you were 17 and a high school graduate. I graduated from high school in June of 42. So I was able to take the tests. I passed it, so I was sworn in as a private in the reserve. And that's the reason they did that. I was actually in the military. So when I turned 18, I didn't have to register for the draft. So I was reserved for flying. Because once you register for the draft at 18, they were just taking people and putting them in the service. Remember during World War II, upwards of, what, 16 million people served in the armed forces. And uh, so anyway, I was reserved and went into the service in July of 19. Of course, I went to Keister Field for basic training. Now, Keister Field was originally segregated there. We had our own, uh, Afro-Americans had their own area with a, a barracks, the orderly room, and they had their own separate mess hall down there at, at Keister Field. And that's just how segregated they were. Now, for training, we went to Tuskegee. Uh, Tuskegee Institute, college training detachment for three months, then flying training, went to Tuskegee, then back to Tuskegee Institute for uh, uh, what's called primary flying. Primary flying was contracted out to schools and universities where the, the schools and universities could hire civilians to train the pilots uh, because the Army didn't have enough pilots to do everything. So we got that at Tuskegee and then back to Tuskegee Army Airfield where basically in advance and we graduated in September 1944. After training at, more training at Tuskegee and at Walterboro, South Carolina, we shipped overseas in February 1945. And I flew missions in March and April 1945. I was 19 years old, flying a P-51 second lieutenant. You couldn't beat that. And uh, the only problem was that of our group that went over, what, 23 of us from our class, uh, six months after we graduated, six of them were dead three on combat missions and three in, in uh, training missions, so uh, in, in training accidents. So life could be a little tough for us, but you learn to deal with that. Uh, the war ended in, in May, of course. Colonel Davis came back to the States and he became commander of the 477th Composite Group, which meant that he had two bomb squadrons in there, B-25s, and one fighter squadron, 99th Fighter Squadron. I came back and went to Tuskegee for, till it closed in 1946, then to Lockburn in November 46, and I was discharged because I wouldn't sign on indefinite. I decided to go to school. And in September 1947, well, let me go back a minute. In May of 1946, at Talladega College in Alabama, I met a young woman there, we fell in love. And she graduated and went to New York University, New York, uh, What's the school up there? Anyway, Juilliard School of Music to work on a master's. So instead of going back to Philadelphia and going to Drexel, I applied to New York University School of Engineering. In September 1947, I went to New York, started school, and of course we married right away. And of course she got pregnant right away, which was to have an effect on our lives after that, see. Uh, but going back again, in the spring of 1947, Colonel Davis at Lockburn was head of the 477th Composite Group, two bomb squadrons and one fighter squadron in the 99th. But the Army deactivated 477th and the two bomb squadrons and reactivated the 332nd Fighter Group, three fighter squadrons. He reactivated, had the 99th, added the 100th and the 301st. 
now he had three fighter squadrons that needed fighter pilots for those squadrons. But what he actually had was one fighter squadron with two bomb squadrons. A lot of those bomb squadron pilots had never flown fighters. So his experience in the fighters was, went downhill quite, quite rapidly. In addition, you've got to realize the impact of this thing of segregation. The navigators and the bombardiers who had flown on those B-25s were now out of jobs. Because, because of race, they could not be assigned to SAC as a navigator or bombardier. They had to stay at, if they stayed in the service, they had to stay at Lock Run and take whatever job they could get. And that's just the way it was in those days. But in September 1947, the United States Air Force was created as a separate service. What had been the United States Army Air Forces was moved from the Army and became the basis for the United States Air Force. And, uh, and Colonel Dick, the United States Air Force then had its own budget. Instead of being part of the Army and had its own budget, was quite generous compared to the original budget. And so Colonel Davis was over to, able to take action after that to get more experienced fighter pilots. In the fall of 1947, he sent letters out to people who had flown with him in Europe, asked them to come back into the service, and, about, and I received one of those letters in New York. I didn't intend to respond, but then we realized with the baby on the way and whatnot in May, expected in May, that something had to be done. And so in January 1948, I contacted Lock One and said, I will come back if I can finish this semester at NYU. They said, fine, so he gave me orders to report the 3rd of June, 1948, report to Lockburn. Everything was fine. Then my mother-in-law got into the action. She said, the baby's going to be born in May. You're going to be leaving the third week in May. There's no place for a young baby just a few weeks old. And my wife said, yes, that's right. So then my wife went to Mobile, where we, a family lived to have a, a first child. She went there in April. Well, everything was fine, no problem. I, I envisioned that when I reported to Lockburn, I knew so many people there. I knew the fellows, I knew their wives and whatnot. And now I'd be reporting with my wife. I could introduce them to these great people and just have a great time. But the end of April 1948, everything changed. General Carl Spots, chief of staff of the Air Force, announced publicly that the Air Force was going to do away with racial segregation due to an interest of economy and efficiency. And he said that was the Air Force's new policy, and it was in the process of developing a program or a plan as to how and when that would be implemented. Well, I was really floored by that. I did not want to see that coming right now, because I wanted to meet all the people at Lockburn, to meet my wife and whatnot. And it shows you how your mind can react to certain things. I knew that integration would be the best thing for us, but not at that time. See. In any case, uh, our daughter was born in May of 1948. And two weeks later, semester ended. I went to meet her in Mobile and then got back to Lockburn. Julian, uh, got back to Lockburn. But in the, because of racial segregation, racial integration move, I started thinking about my career more. And I felt going back into the service as just a pilot is not a good idea. So I figured, what else can I do? I decided, well, I want to fly all of the fighters, part of the Air Defense Command. I was good at flying in weather. I liked that, so all of the fighters. So. And I said, also, if I'm in the service, I want to be around airplanes all the time. How do I do that? Maintenance. I knew nothing about engines. Heck, I hadn't even driven an automobile until I was getting ready to go overseas before the war. The first time I drove an automobile, I was flying the P-47 at that time. And so I knew nothing about engines. But radar was the key, I thought. And I said, that's what I'll try for when I get into service. And so as soon as I reported to Lockburn in June, the first thing I asked was, who maintains the radar on airplanes? And they said, Airborne Electronics Maintenance Officer. I said, where can you get training for that? They said, at Keystone Field, Mississippi, 10 months long. I said, can I apply for that? Yes. Now, here's the situation. The Air Force, prior to integration, 
stationed at Lockburn, I could not have applied for that course because they had no airplanes at Lockburn with radar on them. And any school you went to in the service, we had to have that field at Lockburn. If they didn't have it, I couldn't have applied for it. But when the Air Force in April made the decision to integrate racially, all schools were open to us. And so right then and there, I applied for it. And uh, then I concentrated on flying June and July uh, to get back my proficiency. Of course, at the end of July, President Truman signed this executive order, 9981, directing the Army, Navy, and Air Force to submit plans for racial integration. And you know, sometimes it bothers me when I see the things that go around and notices going around that so-and-so and so, President Truman signed an executive order which integrated the military. And I look at that and say, well, that may be a true statement, but it's not accurate, you see. Because I go back to the time realizing that the Air Force was the service that really started it. And the Air Force meant it. Uh, but anyway, he put that order out. In mid-August, my family came to Lockburn. We found a house. So the next day, we were supposed to sign a lease for it. Went back to the base and found I was going to be transferred to Keister Field to go to that electronic school. So my wife went back to Mobile, and Mobile's only about 50 or 60 miles from Keister Field. And so I started at Keister Field as the second person to, to, uh, to register school, a school at Keister. Someone else from Lockburn went there before me early September. Now, you must realize that segregation was still part of the military. Now, Keister Field had a history such that they had separate services, separate areas for enlisted people because they took basic training there. But they apparently had never had black officers at Keister Field. So they had no separate space for black officers on base. So the first person who got there was a fellow named Don Simmons. He got there the second week in, in September. He's about 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 brown skin. He's a good pilot. But suddenly he shows up. What do they do with him? Now the barracks and the VOQ was a regular World War II barracks with individual rooms for the officers and common restroom facilities. Instead of creating a separate space for him, they put him in a room in a regular VOQ. So now Don Simmons, for the first time in his life, when he went down to, to shave or brush his teeth, he's standing next to white officers. That's the only other group that was in the barracks. So people that East of Field decided to take the bull by the horns and integrate. I showed up two weeks later, and I'm in that same building. Nothing but wife around. And we had no restrictions on the base. So East of Field seemed to be leading this thing of racial integration. And we were grateful for that. Uh, in 1949, the Army, Navy, and Air Force submitted their plans for racial integration. In May of 1949, the Army, I mean the Air Force and the Navy plans were approved. The Army's plan was rejected. The Army resubmitted their plan in 1950 and they started racial integration about the time of the Korean War. But the Air Force in early May received notification that their plan was accepted and the Air Force was ready to move out. They had people at Lockburn to interview people. At the end of September 1949, they deactivated the 3rd Section Fighter Group, and within a short period of time, the hundreds of people at Lockburn received orders transferring them, to, transferring them to Air Force bases all over the world. So the Air Force was the first service to racially integrate all of its units. I graduated from the school at Keystone in the August 1949. I didn't get all of the fighters that I wanted. Instead, I sent to the 19th Bomb Group on the island of Guam, B-29 aircraft. I signed as maintenance officer electronic. I was in charge of OIC of a, the maintenance group, 25 to 30 airmen, all white. I was the first person of color in the 19th Bomb Group. And but being a pilot, I was encouraged to fly the airplane, so I uh, was able to train and check out in the B-29. I had to demonstrate that I could take it off, land it, and handle emergency procedures. I then qualified as a co-pilot. Of course, I didn't have that much flying time. So I was put on a flight crew in the 28th Bomb Squadron. 
in May of 1950, we got a new squadron commander, Colonel Fred W. Mill. I'll never forget that name. He was about six feet, about five or six inches taller than me. Then I found out quickly that he would not talk to me except in the line of duty. He did not agree with racial integration. And that's okay. I could live with that. Uh, but when the Korean War started, we immediately moved to Okinawa and started flying out of Okinawa, missions over Korea. We, our crew flew our first mission the 30th of June, 1950, so we were right there at the beginning. We flew the next day, to, uh, July 1st, and we flew about six, four more missions, and on the 12th of July, we were supposed to fly our seventh mission. Got up early, ready to fly, and as a co-pilot, when we get to the airplane, you get in your seat, co-pilot seat, and I go through my checklist, the aircraft commander walks around the airplane and checks the airplane. Then once all the people check, finish the checklist, we get on the airplane, start engines, and take off. Well, I was in my seat, going through my checklist, when I hear this voice from outside say, Hardy, get down out of the airplane. My first thought is, who's talking to me like that? I looked out in the squadron commander. That's okay. I got down out of the airplane. <laughs> we had a few words, and then he let me know I was not going to fly on that mission. I was really depressed then, so he replaced me right then and there. He had a replacement pilot with him. So uh, when I left, I got my things out of the airplane. He was talking to the aircraft commander, uh, and I left. And I was depressed that day. My crew took off with his replacement co-pilot. Later that day, I was, as a maintenance officer, I was heading back down the flight line because if I don't fly, as a maintenance officer, I meet the airplanes to talk to the crew members make sure our equipment worked okay. But on the way, he saw me. And I tried to avoid him by keeping straight down this way, but he cut me off. And as he cut me off, as he came up close, I saluted him, of course. He didn't return my salute. Instead, he walked up and put, stopped me by putting his hand on my shoulder. And he just leaned over his taller than me in a way. And it, it took me a few seconds to realize what he was saying. He let me know that that airplane with my crew on board was over North Korea, over the target. They were attacked by two fighters. They set an engine on fire, and a crew had to bail out. My crew had to bail out, and I wasn't with them. Now, they headed out over the western part of Korea, out over the water, when they started bailing out. And most of the people were rescued, but the first two to bail out, Bob Layton, the, the bombardier, and one of the gunners from the back, they landed in North Korean territory and were captured. Uh, the rest of the crew got back. <clears throat> I was glad to see them, but they didn't stay there. They stayed on, on Okinawa just long enough to get their things, and they shipped them back to the States. And I was left with no crew. I did check it out to see if I could fly again, but Colonel Miller didn't want me flying anymore. However, someone was looking out for me, I thought. A week or 10 days later, he was transferred to group to be deputy group commander. He got a promotion. But we got a new squadron commander who put me back on flying again. And I was able to fly my uh, 45 missions over Korea, and, uh, which, which satisfied me. Uh, I tell that story uh, because it illustrates the type of people you run into. Although racial integration was a, the way things are supposed to be, individuals could change that. A lot happened after that. I went to SAC because of my maintenance. I was put into maintenance squadrons in SAC. I didn't fly SAC airplanes. I flew base flight aircraft. So I spent four years in SAC, and then I was able to go to the Institute of Technology at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for two years and got a BS in electrical engineering. I was then assigned, in Japan, assigned to Japan, third bomb wing as a maintenance supervisor. Very good assignment, loved it. After three years there, end of 1960, I was transferred to Plattsburgh Air Force Base, New York. Air refueling wing, I was a squadron commander up there. Who was my wing commander? That same Colonel Fred W. Miller. He's now a full colonel, and he's my wing commander. And when I walked in and found out who he was, I was devastated. But it so happened that I served with him a little over two years. And I love working with him the second time. If anyone had a favorite, I was his favorite squadron commander. And I love working with him. Now, earlier, I applied for a regular commission several times. 
and didn't make it, so I've resigned to that. But the second year up there, I received a regular commission in the grade of major under Colonel Miller. He had a lot to do with that. And I would have stayed with him forever if I could. But after the Korean, we had a Cuban Missile Crisis in the summer, in the fall of 1962. And the one thing came up that caused me to change my mind. I received information, a letter from the Air Force Institute of Technology that they had a new graduate level program that just been approved and they wanted to implement it right away. They did not have time to advertise. And it went through their records and I was one of the people they selected to attend that course if I wanted it. I wasn't sure I wanted it, I looked at the curriculum. A lot of math involved there. And I wrote a letter back trying to uh, go to another program and I got a letter back and said yes or no. And that was it, was take it or leave it, so I took it. So I went to this technology and got my master's in systems engineering. Reliability was a real thing. And so I went on from there. Now, although the program doesn't state it, what time do I, have? I ended up being assigned to the Air Force to ESD, Electronic Systems Division of Air Force Systems Command. I was up there for over five years. I made lieutenant colonel up there. Now, I don't know any people here ever heard of the Audubon program. Audubon program was a DCA program for the first worldwide direct dial, military worldwide direct dial telephone system. And because of my engineering degrees, I made lieutenant colonel in 1966. I was made program manager and chief of engineering for the 490, 490L Overseas Audubon Switches Program. 16 switches overseas. Audubon services were provided in the States by local telephone companies. And we provided a tie-in at 10 sites in Europe, one in Panama, and six in the Pacific. The tie-in to the States, by worldwide direct call telephone system. It was a good introduction to that, except that the program slipped 19 months right after I got onto it. But it was successful, and in, in uh, June of 1969, we cut over the first five sites in Europe, one in Panama, and from then on, for many months, the others cut, uh, cut over. And we had a worldwide direct dial telephone system from any base in Europe to any base in the States here, eventually to the Pacific and whatnot. And so when people talk about my career, they talk about flying here, flying there, I look back and figure that was the gem, but it had its, 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 its cost. I was away so much that my marriage ended up in problems. I spent twice a year, I'd go to Europe for a month or two at the time. Then the Pacific for a month, once a year. And to Panama. Panama had more problems than any other switch. But that was just part of the effort. I was in that program for three and a half years. First switches cut over and it was ending, winding down, when what happens? You're looking for pilots to fly a 119. They built some gunships. And I had 119 time, which incidentally I got in sack. Hundreds of hours to 119. That's another story. And so I ended up as, as a lieutenant colonel, as a I'm training at Lockburn, a flight crew on a 119 gunship. And I ended up going to Vietnam for one year. I was a lieutenant colonel, so instead of flying as a crew, the base at Lockburn, at, at, at Vietnam, was at Phan Rang Air Base in the southern part, southern part of South Vietnam. But all of the airplanes were located at two forward operating locations, one at Yudon in northern Thailand, and one at Da Nang in northern Vietnam. I became the commander of a detachment up at Yudon for about four or five months, and then moved to Da Nang to become the commander there. Quite a difference. In World War II, I was 19, the youngest guy in the United Up there, I'm the oldest guy in the group. I was 45 then. And uh, most of my pilots were 19, 20 years old. I made good friends with all of these people, and today we still have reunions, which I attend. And uh, I'm the old guy in the reunion, because most of the other commanders aren't here anymore. But you know, a funny thing about that, several years ago at Fort Walton Beach, I was sitting around with all of these guys who, uh, they were 19 and 20 in Vietnam. And I said, and now this was 40 years later. I said, geez, they're looking old. You know, 
Well, you know, someone going from 20 to 60 changes much more than someone going from 40 to 80, you know. And, and so that is, I wanted to bring that out particularly because the Audubon service, whatnot, which I was so proud of that effort, whatnot. So I look back on my career. We went in racial segregation. When we came out, a complete change. Because one of the things in World War II was you never find an Afro-American supervising a white person. We're now in Vietnam War. There's complete reversal. A black person can supervise anyone. A white person can supervise anyone. And so when I look back on my service, I'm so proud of the Air Force and the people who ran the Air Force from the very beginning. And I just thank God that I was able to participate in that and survive that. And I just, I talk to a lot of people and I talk to kids about opportunities that are available. But to me, the key is education. I was always ready to go to school again, to learn something again, and apply it when I could. Thank you.